Greetings, everyone. Welcome to tonight's unmoderated conversation between two incredibly intriguing thinkers. If I can, I'd like to make an observation that relates to tonight's program. We're living in a sped up time. Change happens so quickly. We're constantly living on the brink of what's next. The future keeps arriving before we get a grasp on the present. And so there's great interest in hearing what really brilliant people have to say about navigating the forks in the road that keep coming at us. Kevin Roos and Ethan Zuckerman think about big questions from their respective perches and have answers or at least theories to big questions about our future. Like, how do we participate in public life? How do we survive technological change? And maybe they even have answers to super big questions like, how do we survive as a society? And how do we maintain our humanity? Each of them have articulated their views in books. In Future Proof, Nine Rules for Humans in the Age of Automation, Kevin lays out a hopeful, pragmatic vision of how humans can thrive in the machine age. In Mistrust, Why Losing Faith in Institutions Provides the Tools to Transform Them, Ethan addresses our modern pervasive mistrust in institutions and skepticism that neither elections nor protests will bring change and proposes a different way to think about participation in public life. These books are launching points for tonight's conversation, but who knows where it will go. I just want to say how excited I am to have such innovative thinkers in conversation for the next hour. So quickly, let me introduce myself. My name is Marcia Eli. I'm the Director of Programs at the Center for Brooklyn Hi History, which is a proud part of the Brooklyn Public Library. We hold the world's most extensive collection of Brooklyn-related materials. We bring education programs to classrooms across the city. And soon we'll be presenting exhibitions again. And every single week, we offer free public programs like this one through the library's programming arm, BPL Presents. I really hope that you'll join the Center for Brooklyn History and BPL Presents for many upcoming programs. Before I disappear, I wanna share just two final notes. I mentioned Kevin and Ethan's books and I hope that you think about purchasing them um, when uh, we will be putting a link in the chat so that you can do so locally at the community bookstore in Park Slope, Brooklyn in support of our local Brooklyn businesses. And I want to invite all of you to participate and share your questions. Type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Now it is my pleasure to more formally introduce tonight's conversationalists and hand it over to them. Ethan Zuckerman is Associate Professor of Public Policy, Information and Communication at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and Director of the Institute for Digital Public Infrastructure. His research focuses on the use of media as a tool for social change, alternative business and governance models for the internet and quantitative studies of digital media. Kevin Roos is an award-winning technology columnist for the New York Times host of the podcast Rabbit Hole and a regular guest on the daily and other TV and, real, and radio shows. He writes and speaks regularly on topics that include automation <clears throat> and, a, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and AI, social media, disinformation and cybersecurity and digital wellness. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. I leave it to you. Thank you, Marcia. Um, Ethan, hello. Where hey, am I? Where are we finding you today? So I am home in uh, Western Massachusetts, basically three hours drive uh, due north of our friends in Brooklyn. Uh, how about you? I, uh, I, you have a slightly different uh, backdrop behind you than the last time I saw you. Where, where am I reaching you? I'm in the Bay Area in California, and uh, this is. Uh, the Windows XP backdrop behind me, and you have a, a vintage, it looks like I, a vintage Mac I'm, behind I'm, you. I'm a Mac guy rather than a Windows guy. So I've got my, uh, my SE30, which was my dream computer when I was in college. Um, 
look, my friend, where, where do we start? We have these two fascinating books here. I've, I've got yours right here under mistrust over my shoulder. Um, we should bring these two into dialogue. Where do we go with this? Yeah, well, I, uh, I've been reading your book. I confess I am not done with it, but I am, I am well into it and really enjoying it. Um, your book is, is Mistrust. Um, what's your subtitle? Why Losing Faith in Institutions Provides the Tools to Transform Them. And this is a topic that I've been thinking about a lot um, and, and not as much as you have clearly, but I, I, I'm, I have so many questions for you, but I just, I'm curious by something when we were sort of getting ready for this, you mentioned that um, we had both sort of accidentally written self-help books. And, um, and I, I wonder what your sort of version of that is. But for me, I mean, I started writing about AI and automation in large part because I was, it was literally a self-help project. Like I was worried about myself and I am a writer at the New York Times, which has existed for 170 years and is not exactly what you think of when you think of, you know, job of the future. And so I was sort of concerned about my own future and, and trying to figure out what automation and AI would mean for me, but sort of walk me through your process of, of deciding to write this book. Sure. And then I, I want to come back to that because I, I, you have such wonderful stories in this about ways in which journalism is quite literally being automated and, and you know, you can see the, the, the sort of spark of fear within that. Um, Mistrust is a book that really came out of nine years of teaching at MIT and running a center there called the Center for Civic Media. And what ended up happening was this was a center within MIT's Media Lab. It's a place where people are really having a lot of fun exploring the frontiers of technology. But I sort of got all the activists uh, in my lab, right? The, the folks who wanted to look at how could technology change the world for the better. And what I started to find with talking to people is that they were very suspicious of existing political systems. They were very suspicious of this idea that electing good people to office and voting for them and leaving them to the work of governance was gonna transform the world in a positive way. And what they wanted to look for were different levers to make social change. And at first people's reaction to this is to sort of say, everyone just needs to grow up and learn how to do civics. You need to learn how the system works and then you'll see that it all works really well. But that's not really the moment we're in. We're sort of at this moment where many large systems seem not to be working well. And I decided to sort of take that seriously. And I took seriously this idea that one of the characteristics of this moment in time is very high mistrust in institutions. If you ask Americans if they trust the government in Washington to do the right thing, only about 15% are, are gonna tell you that they have a great deal of confidence in this. And so I wanted to take seriously these people who were really mistrustful of kind of what you might think of as the standard plan, go into government, go get a good job, work within the system, and I wanted to sort of recognize the people who are sort of breaking away and breaking out of the system. But now I'm sort of realizing reading your book that there's other things that I, I should have been worried about as well. Your book takes this really thoughtful sort of middle ground on AI as sort of threat or opportunity, right? You, you end up dismissing a lot of these sort of extreme scenarios. You tell us at one point to, to worry about spreadsheets and not about Skynet. How did that translate for, for you? Did, did you find yourself freaked out by these people who are sort of promising to automate everything? Should, should we believe them? Did you write this literally as a way of sort of trying to prevent yourself from being automated out of a job? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 more what I noticed was, you know, I live in the Bay Area and before every conversation out here was about Bitcoin and NFTs and stuff, it was about AI. I mean, this was yeah. a couple of years ago and people were obsessed with AI. Companies were spending billions of dollars in R&D to, you know, inject machine learning into everything they were doing. And so I think naturally I started learning more about it and hearing more about it. And, it, and I was really kind of put off by the tenor of the conversation, because as you said, it was like very bipolar. It was like either you thought technology was going to solve all the world's problems and usher in, you know, 
cures for cancer and we're going to fix climate change and we're all going to live, you know, lives of enlightened leisure while the robots do all the dirty work for us. Or, you know, there were sort of the sky is falling, you know, Cassandra's who said the robots are going to take all the jobs and we're going to be, you know, slaves uh, to, to, you know, robots on Elon, Elon Musk's like Mars colony or something. And so I thought like neither of those things can be true, um, but I, I wanted to sort of look for the middle ground and, and really to apply it in a practical way because that was the other piece that was missing. It's like, you'd go to these conferences and hear these talks about AI and they would put up these scary charts about how many jobs would be displaced and then they'd be over and like the, the talk would end and there'd be nothing sort of practical for people who are worried about this happening to them. So th those were the, the things I was trying to address. Um, but, but I think there's something bigger that I've been, sort of, that I think sort of is a common thread between, between our books, which is that I think there's this balancing act between sort of utopian optimism and sort of cynical nostalgia. Um, and, and I would say that we both try to occupy a space in the middle. And one thing that I was, I was excited about and, and am excited about in reading your book is that you're not taking the side of someone who says, you know, all these institutions are corrupt and it's great that they're, you know, people are losing faith in burn them. Burn them all because, down. Right. Yeah, burn them all down. And you're also not sort of sepia toned, nostalgic for, you know, the golden age of media or whatever. And I'm, I, I've been sort of frustrated by this element of your conversation too. I mean, one book that everyone out here in Silicon Valley talks about constantly is um, Revol Revolt of the Public by, by Martin Gurry. And, you know, he is um, a former CIA analyst and he's very sort of libertarian leaning. And, and he wrote this whole book about basically how institutions are crumbling because they're all, you know, full of crap and all the elites have been lying to people and they know it. And so now we have, you know, the destruction of these institutions and, and declining trust in them. And that's a good thing because, you know, they were always lying to us anyway. And, and you sort of strike a nice balance, I thought, between sort of realizing that the decline in trust in institutions has some good elements to it, but also some negative ones. So would you sort of walk me through your sort of, uh, you know, thesis, uh, antithesis, and then synthesis, like how you sort of came to your position? Sure. Let, let me let me see if I can get there. So remember, I'm I'm sort of trying to take seriously my students who are involved with things like the Occupy movement and who are looking at other ways of making social change that are sort of breaking away from institutions. And I realized that sort of my vision of social change has a certain sepia tone to it. it it's really coming out of the civil rights movement of the 1960s, right? So either we got to put legislation in the courts, we, in, in, we got to pass legislation, we got to win battle in the courts, or we take to the streets and demand that these changes happen. And I think a lot of people who work in social change have, have really sort of absorbed that as a formula. Um, so I got very curious whether something had changed between the civil rights era and now. And the main thing that's changed is confidence in those institutions. Uh, the height of the civil rights movement 79% of Americans would say that they had a great deal or almost total faith in the federal government to do the right thing all or most of the time. That number collapses during the 1970s. There's just a massive slide that begins with Nixon, goes all the way down through Carter. Um, and by the end of the Carter presidency, you've got less than one in four Americans who have you know, confidence in the federal government over the 80s, that spreads um, really through this sort of Reagan moment of government can do nothing right, give it all out to the private sector. And you see confidence in all aspects of government, not just the federal government sort of increase. And then as we get into the 21st century, we start having these individual moments 
where institutions just break, right? So we have the Catholic Church sex scandals, and suddenly people realize that having uncritical faith in the church is probably not a very good idea. You have uh, the financial crash of 2007, 2008, where people suddenly realize that the banks and big business may not be as sound as we thought. And the problem is when you get there, you suddenly hit this point where you sort of say, well, wait a second, I want to change the world. Where do I push? Like, what do I do? If I don't have faith in government, it's hard to make change there. If I don't have faith in business or sort of other institutions, it's hard to make faith there. I actually see that loss of faith as potentially very liberating. And for me, what it lets us do is look at the institutions that are just flat out failing, right? So right now, policing is in crisis in the United States, right? So at the moment where we are dealing with the, the murder trial around George Floyd, we have another death at the hands of a police officer uh, in the suburbs of Minneapolis. It makes perfect sense that those communities have almost no faith in that system. And small incremental changes from within that system um, are probably just not going to cut it. Uh, communities of color have really good reasons to have sort of transformed and lose faith. This is the moment where something like defund the police leads us very quickly to, well, how do we build something else? Can we maybe build something where our traffic isn't handled by people who have lethal weapons? where we have wellness checks being done by social workers. So this is the sort of possibility that comes out of sort of realizing that we have enough mistrust in an institution that we actually have to turn a corner. But one of the things that I find fascinating about this is of course, a lot of what's going on in this book is this notion of sort of disruptive innovation, right? there's this rhetoric around things that are broken must be disrupted that, that's clearly informing sort of where I'm going with mistrust, although I'm trying to be critical about it. You're really living sort of right in the center of this. Do you end up feeling like the people who are in the disruption business are taking those consequences seriously enough, right? You're writing in this book about people who see enormous amounts of money to be made, not just in eliminating jobs, but really reshaping what work looks like and in some real ways, what human identity looks like. You and I would probably both introduce ourselves in terms of our work. I'm a professor, you're a journalist. Do you think this culture of disruption is taking seriously those issues beyond the funding and the technology, but sort of the deeper social issues that are sort of associated with this? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I think the people who are building and implementing this technology are starting to take the implications seriously, but it's not how they like to, it's not how they conceive of themselves. They don't conceive of themselves as builders of, of, in, of new institutions. They see themselves as disruptors of old ones. So, you know, I think that we see, for example, in something like social media, I think there was a real reluctance for a long time at companies like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube to acknowledge the gatekeeping role that they had um, and to sort of conceive of themselves as powerful institutions because they were the little guys. They were putting technology, they were the democratizers of technology. They were not the new gatekeepers. And I think belatedly they have sort of accepted that even if they don't see themselves as new gatekeepers, society does. And so now, you know, instead of yelling at Rupert Murdoch, we yell at Mark Zuckerberg or something, but it's essentially the same power structure. Um, but I, yeah, I'm, 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 hesitant to say that they all accept their their responsibility. I mean, I, I remember um, a conversation, actually the, the first, the introduction to, the, to my book, I, I talk about this conversation I had with a guy at a party in San Francisco a few years ago. And, um, you know, I introduced myself, he introduced himself, he, he ran a, a, an AI startup. And um, 
And he told me very excitedly about this new software that they had created, which he was calling the Boomer Remover. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> um, and he said, yeah, we, we call the Boomer Remover because it, you know, it's this software that basically allows companies to replace middle managers, highly paid, you know, generally older, um, less technologically sophisticated, um, you know, middle and upper managers. And I remember I was standing next to another tech reporter and we kind of asked him like, well, does that like, are you excited that these people are losing their jobs, you know, because of this stuff you built? Like, and, he's, and he just sort of said like, well, you know, I, it's not my area of concern. Like I just make the tools. Yeah. And, and I think that's a the, common- The rockets attitude. go up, who cares where they go down? It's not my department, says Werner von Braun, yes. Totally, totally. But I, I think in some ways that it's related to this disdain for conventional authorities. I mean, they see themselves as, uh, a lot of technologists see themselves as, as sort of disrupting systems that are fundamentally broken. Um, and that, you know, that's a good thing to do. If we can replace, you know, the Federal Reserve with cryptocurrency, um, that's a good thing to do. Because instead of placing our trust in people and politicians and corrupt governments, we can place our trust in math and math is never wrong. Um, I, I love that moment where um, everything was going to be Uber, right? The Uberization of everything. And you looked at Travis Kalanick and, and the people who are actually running Uber and they had to demonize the taxi system, right? They had to sort of demonstrate that, you know, this was a truly evil, awful system and therefore the, the mission to disrupt it was in a sense, a, a holy war. Um, I do get this sense that some of the people who are disrupting things really do have this vision of, of themselves. You know, they're, they're not entirely far from um, some of the other very passionate people you've studied when you've gone deep into the evangelical community or, or, or lately gone deep into the, the sort of QAnon community. One of the things that I, I found so fascinating about this book is that it, it's much more personal than a lot of your explorations. You, you're really, I, I think historically, a chronicler of communities. You've written incredibly thoughtfully um, about communities that we often don't get to see the inside of, Wall Street, the tech industry. Um, but you seem to really be taking some of this disruption and the consequences of it very Personally, I found when you were writing about machine drift, um, that seemed like a, a, a very vulnerable and sort of very personal moment of that, where you sort of felt like technology was like personally making you mediocre. Can I, can I get you to sort of talk about, you know, when, when these social shifts sort of get deeply personal like that? Yeah. I mean, I don't want to blame technology for my mediocrity. Um, my <laughs> mediocrity is mine alone. <laughs> And it predates technology. But, you know, I, th this concept of machine drift, which I write about at some length, is, is sort of my attempt to kind of put words to this feeling that I had, that I was essentially outsourcing my entire life to machines. That, um, you know, sort of accidentally and incrementally over time, I had become, I had placed a lot of trust in machines to, to you know, make the decisions that govern my life, you know, what restaurant should I order from? What Netflix show should I watch? I even, I subscribed to one of those like wardrobe in a box services. Have you ever done one of those? Like, where I, it, I, I think you can tell that that I've never <laughs> even taken my wardrobe that seriously. Never, never mind, you know, uh, subscribing to those things, yes. So I was literally like letting an algorithm dress me. And like, that's fine if, if you, if you want to do that, if you don't want to spend the mental cycles there. But there was a moment, I remember I was looking in the mirror and I'd just gotten one of these boxes delivered to me that was algorithmically picked for me. And I was like looking in the mirror and I was like, I don't even like this stuff. Like, I don't even think this looks good, but it's like what the algorithm told me to wear. So I'm going to wear it. And that was sort of the feeling of, of machine drift kind of encapsulated was like, I don't even really know what my own preferences are anymore. Um, and I think that's, that's, you know, something that I struggle with constantly. I think it's something a lot of people struggle with, especially after this year of just, you know, filtering all of our communication and social lives through screens. Um, 
you know, I, I'm not anti-screen. I don't think we should all, you know, um, you know, chuck our phones in the trash and, and move to the mountains and, and become Amish. But I do think like we haven't, something has been happening. There's been sort of a slow takeover of a lot of our agency. Um, and, and a lot of that is, is through AI and automation and personalized recommendations and news feeds and things like that. So I, I don't know, do you feel that at all in your life? It's interesting. I, um, I, I think, you know, I, I like to, to think of myself as radically individual, just like everyone else. And, and um, I, I think the reason that I, that I found myself looking at that, that chapter is that, of course, it's happening, right? I, I have a, a huge curated record and CD collection that I rarely listen to anymore because I listen to Spotify. Um, and I don't think Spotify's algorithm is all that great. I've, I've enjoyed it exposing me to some music, um, but in general, it, it, it doesn't actually really have a handle on me and yet it's easier. Uh, and it's more of a challenge to sort of make myself go out and, and do those things. Um, I'm enormously grateful for things like Netflix because they probably have uh, helped me stay sane um, through all of these systems. I think understanding um, those implications, the, those sort of downsides of things, right? I, I think, so you write a lot in that chapter around collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering is this technology that lets us sort of implicitly ask a whole lot of people who are like us, what did they like as well? And then there's a decent chance that we're gonna like it. And it's helpful a lot of the time. It's really useful to get restaurant reviews before you're randomly choosing something on the corner. It's a good way of getting a sense for whether I'm going to like this movie or not like this movie. But you really have this sort of strong defense of thinking about the ways in which we are uniquely human. You end up suggesting that to, to try to avoid being automatable, you want people to be social, you want people to be surprising. When I sort of look for parallels behind this, I, I think in some ways it's these warnings of these slow changes. Um, when I look at this question of mistrust, I feel like it's evolved throughout my entire life. I'm born in 1973. So I'm born during that steep slide of trust. Most of my political career has been during these years where we've had less than full trust in institutions. And then suddenly you have that moment where you realize, you know, things have somehow gone radically wrong mine was not the algorithmically curated clothing. Mine happened after the book came out and it was, it was January 6th. It was the moment at which some of the people that you and I both are trying to understand, we're trying to report on, people who've gone very, very far down a rabbit hole now have so little trust in the American system that they interpreted Donald Trump's words as instructions to literally go take over the US Capitol because there was no other way to sort of preserve democracy. And part of what I tried to do in the mistrust book is sort of make the point that this is not entirely YouTube's fault. This is not entirely the internet's fault. This is 40 odd years. And, and so I wonder whether you're on the leading edge of something that really ends up being a deep social transformation 30 or 40 years sort of sort of further out on this. Well, let, let's talk about January 6th because I think that's a really sort of good jumping off point because one thing that you you write in, and you do you don't write about January 6th cuz that was, you know, after after the book well, was the book was in print, yeah. Right. You, you do talk about QAnon and obviously QAnon had a big presence uh, at the Capitol that day. And, you know, QAnon is one of the examples that I think people tend to use of sort of things that arise out of loss of trust. Um, something else would be like the, the GameStop, you know, <laughs> fiasco where you had traders on Reddit who just decided that Wall Street was a mirage and that they could essentially like take it over just by sheer will. Um, but I, I'm curious, like, because one thing that I've observed when I've been reporting on QAnon is that it's not that they don't trust anyone. Um, it's just that they don't trust 
sort of mainstream media. I mean, they, they do trust Donald Trump. I mean, they trust him in an incredible amount where to the point where they think he's secretly, you know, got all these sealed indictments and he's, you know, spelling out the letter Q with his hands and he's got 17 flags behind him as a sign. Like they're, they're placing an incredible amount of trust in, in very specific people. So is it that people like, you know, movements like QAnon are about the dissolution of trust altogether, or is it just changing who they're trusting? Yeah, so so it, it's really interesting when you start looking at trust, sociologists men, measure trust a whole bunch of different ways. And I, I sort of look at a couple of them in the book. Um, you can ask people, you know, how much they trust their neighbors. Uh, and there's a question where you say, can most people be trusted or you can never be too careful? Uh, there's one that I talk about in the book, uh, how much do you trust strangers? How much do you trust the place you live? And it's the wallet experiment. Uh, if you left your wallet at a cafe, back in the days where we went out to cafes, uh, what are the odds that it would get returned to you? Um, and it turns out that people underestimate how trustworthy other people are, right? If, if you ask people, if I leave my wallet in the Brooklyn Library, what's the odds that I'm going to get it back? People will say, oh, you know, 20% chance. And, and the answer is a 60 or 70% chance. It's a much better chance than, than you think. We underestimate how trustworthy people are. Institutions are an entirely different thing. There are some societies where the institutions are really highly trusted. Um, China has really low interpersonal trust. People do not trust that their neighbor is going to return their wallet, but they trust that the government's going to do the right thing at the end of the day. The US is the inversion. We're pretty trusting of individuals. We're really not trusting of institutions. What Trump has managed to do is basically say, don't trust the deep state, don't trust the media, don't trust any of these sort of faceless entities, but I am a individual here, a real human being, you can trust me and in fact, trust nobody else. And it, it's a dictator move. It's kind of a classic move of an individual saying, la tat c'est moi, you know, just follow me. But it's only possible um, at this moment uh, where trust is so low uh, that people are reasonably willing to say, I'm not sure that these institutions will, will stand up to this. Um, but that, that moment, I, I mean, you had been writing from, about QAnon from, from well before that moment. Did you have a sense of surprise at, at January 6th or did you have a sense of inevitability? Uh, no, I think it was totally inevitable. I always thought it was gonna end in bloodshed. Um, not that it's ended, but I think that was sort of a, a climax for the movement. Um, but it really does like like one thing that I've I've observed, and this goes back to sort of interpersonal trust versus institutional trust. Is sometimes I'll I'll call people, you know, who um, who believe in QAnon. I have a bunch of sources now who who are QAnon followers or former QAnon followers, and and they will, you know, it, it obviously takes a while for them to agree to talk to a New York Times reporter because the New York Times is like the, sure, the, sure. the in, er institution. Um, but then they'll say things like, you know, I'll say things like, well, after we get to know each other a little bit, like, like, you don't actually think I'm a, I'm a pedophile Satanist, do you? And they'll say, well, no, I mean, you seem nice. And, you know, I let you into my house and, and, uh, you know, you're, I mean, it's your bosses. They're the yeah, pedophile the Satanists. Editors. Yes. yes. <laughs> the editors are always the pedophile Satanists. Yes. <laughs> yeah, always blame the editor. But but I, I think it is, it's a real question because I think, you know, I I'm not the CEO of the New York Times. I don't I don't run anything there, but I do think that a lot of the people at the New York Times and other media institutions are thinking about how to build back some of this trust. Yeah. And you suggest in your book that it's not it's not as easy as sort of unwinding the, the process that got us here, that, that they're really, there's sort of a new strategy that's called for to kind of rebuild this trust. So how would you rebuild trust if you were the, the CEO of the New York Times? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the hardest one because um, 
it's interesting. The book was not written to help people regain trust. I, I, I realized that, you know, the whole thing, when you name a book mistrust, people sort of say, okay, I'll get to the end of this and you're going to tell me how to rebuild trust in my institution. What, what the book really sets out to do is to sort of say, it's okay if you don't trust anything, you actually can be an effective civic actor. Here's all sorts of ways to be engaged in a new form of civics that doesn't rely on the government. But the truth is, I actually do think there are some solutions to this. Um, one of the things that I've really marveled about is the power of involving people in the institutions. So um, there's a lot of people, again, sort of coming out of the QAnon space of this, maybe not QAnon strictly, but some of the people who are more militia aligned, who ended up getting involved with vote monitoring. And there have been a couple of interviews with people who have said, yeah, you know, I figured I should put my money where my mouth is. I went to monitor the 2020 election and nothing happened. <laughs> and there's really no way to sort of recover trust in an institution than to become part of it. Uh, and I think situations where we've had institutions sort of open themselves up and say, look, we get it. We understand. You don't feel like you understand what's going on in this. Come be part of it. Come even take a very critical look at it. I write in the book about a project in Italy called Monathon, where high school students get invited in to sort of audit and monitor government institutions. And it ends up doing a remarkable amount uh, to sort of increase their confidence with those things. But I'm actually gonna use that to sort of transition to the, the questions that are starting to come into the audience, because that question of who gets to be part of these institutions is actually something that's sort of running through through both of our work here, right? You know, you're referring to this sort of Silicon Valley cabal. I'm, I'm referring to sort of the institutionalists who are inside this. One of the questions that we just got, and it's an appropriate question for a panel involving two white males, what do you think about the lack of diversity in the tech field? Could the downsides of tech utopia be mitigated with more women and people of color creating the new tech? Absolutely. I mean, I think that is, I, I think one reason, and I, I talk a little bit in the book about one of the things I think the tech industry needs to do better on is kind of what a, you know, consequentialist thinking, sort of thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm going to build this thing. How could people misuse this? What are the ways in which, you know, bad actors could take advantage of this, could exploit it? Because that's just not a type of thinking that's prevalent outside maybe the, the trust and safety or the cybersecurity teams at some of the, the largest tech companies. Um, and I think that, you know, one thing that we've learned is that if you let primarily white, you know, guys with, who went to Stanford and Harvard, you know, build all your technology, you're going to have some pretty big blind spots. You're not going to end up taking things like harassment seriously until there's a real problem that threatens your company's growth. And so, I, I absolutely think that inviting more people to the table um, is is kind of step one in in kind of making these institutions uh, more resilient and and maybe more trustworthy. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, one thing you say at the end of the book, you you talk about uh, this sort of group of new rebels, and you actually shout out um, some of my very favorite people. Uh, one of them is my, is my doctoral student, Joy Bullam Winnie, um, who, while she was in my lab at MIT, um, discovered that a piece of software she was trying to use to recognize her face um, couldn't see her. Uh, she has quite dark skin. She's Ghanaian. Uh, the, the system sees me just perfectly. Uh, and in sort of a wonderfully symbolic move, she happened to have a dramatis personae mask uh, kicking around her office and she put it on her face and immediately the system saw her. And one of the conclusions from this was there were not a lot of dark skinned people who tested this software. If someone had, they would not have released the software sort of having that real obvious bug associated with it. Making the analogy to what you just said there, um, you know, Slack notoriously has sort of said, look, we're the office water cooler. We don't need, you know, moderation or blocking or anti-harassment functions. Anyone who has had, you know, the challenge of being female and on the internet would say, of course you need moderation functions. There is no way to interact with someone through a screen without having some ability to moderate. So who gets to be 
around these tables matters immensely. For me on my work, this is where it gets really complicated. A lot of these institutions that people now, in many ways rightly, are sort of saying, we need to tear this down, we need to smash this. These institutions in some cases have tried to be inclusive. Um, the federal government, the US military, these are institutions that have worked really, really hard on questions of diversity. It's very rare that the new rebels, you know, the folks who are sort of coming in and doing the disruption are thinking as seriously uh, about who gets to sort of sit around the table. I, I think for me, the hope is that we can disrupt some of the supporting institutions, that we can sort of find some way of disrupting venture capital or disrupting how the financial flows around this. So maybe we can start funding different things so that it isn't just the, the guys from Stanford all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know if, if, if you can open the chat, you've got a, we've got a couple of other questions here that we may want to um, sort of find into, but um, a, a lot of them are, are sort of um, coming around this question of, of trust directly. Diane asks whether trust is based on basic fear. And if so, how do we consider this problem? Can I, can I get you to, to think about that in the, in the context of, of some of the reporting that you've been doing on QAnon and that you've been doing around uh, the, the far right and sort of the, 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 the heightened visibility of racism? You, you are a very sympathetic reporter in many ways. You, you clearly care pretty deeply for the people that you're reporting from. Do, do you think that these basic fears of not being able to live within these systems um, are, are what's animating some of these people that you're writing about, or, or is it something deeper and, uh, and maybe darker? I mean, I, I think it's important to note that in the context of sort of US politics, trust isn't just evaporating, right? It's not just like disappearing naturally. There's a whole movement um, in, the, in the conservative wing that is sort of systematically trying to destroy people's trust, yeah. you know, in, in the fake news and in the deep state and, you know, all. It, so in some ways, I think it's, it's, it's a less organic phenomenon than maybe in other facets of, of life. Um, and I think it is that that part is, is, you know, has some elements of fear woven into it, you know, fear of change and you know, demographic change or economic change um, can certainly sort of open people up to, you know, strongman arguments um, and, and, and personalities. But yeah, I mean, you're the trust expert, like how much of this is just people, people fearing I don't know, like that they're being lied to. I mean, one one thing I, I will say is like the 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 thing that I'm I'm fascinated by this kind of trope of secret knowledge of you know the, one of the most sort of tried and true formats for a viral YouTube video for many years and and probably still today was like what they don't want you to know about. Black Lives Matter or what they don't want you to know about vaccines or whatever. It's like promising to reveal something sort of forbidden that someone is actively trying to hide from you is like a very enticing formula for getting people to click on whatever you're you're trying to get them to click on. So like, is that about fear of, of sort of being left in the dark or, or like, what is that about? Yeah, I, I mean, you and I have, have, I think, both looked pretty in depth at the phenomenon of conspiracy theories. And at the end of the day, I think conspiracy theories are helpful because reality itself is so scary. And, and it's the unpredictability of reality that's so scary. Um, I had the great pleasure of, of working for and with George Soros for about 15 years. Uh, I, I worked for Open Society Foundations. I was one of the, the lead folks on sort of his various boards of directors helping on a whole bunch of technology issues. If George was responsible for 
one one hundredth of what he gets accused of being responsible for, he would be the most busy 90 something year old man on the planet, right? But it's so much easier to attribute to George Soros and a shadowy cabal around him um, things that you don't like than it is to sort of look at this real complexity that we're in a deeply divided nation um, that many people disagree on very fundamental facts and that a lot of these institutions that we face just aren't working especially well at this moment in time. If you could just come up with the secret of here are the evildoers behind it, whether it's George or now Bill Gates seems to be moving into a lot of this role, you know, it would be a much easier world. All we have to do is focus on that guy. Just get Hillary Clinton into prison. Just get Bill Gates to stop putting 5G chips into all of us and, and everything will be okay. I, I think it's fear of, of just how complicated the world actually is and fear that these systems that we all rely on don't work nearly as well as, as we might hope they did. I, I think for me, my big wake up around this was, was COVID uh, and suddenly realizing that, that I really did want functioning, functioning institutions. I wanted someone to tell me when I should stop getting on airplanes and start working from home. And as it turned out, the institution that did it for me at that point was MIT, which my, was my employer and sort of said it was time to do it, but it wasn't the government. But I was so desperate for, for someone to sort of give me an answer. Um, I, I think I actually felt a certain amount of, of sympathy and solidarity for people sort of looking for answers at that moment. Yeah, let, let's, well, let, let's take another question, but I'm, I'm so yeah. fascinated by the, what you think the pandemic has done for trust in institutions, because I can sort of see it both ways. But. Yeah, I, w let's get to that if, if, if we have time near the end of it. But I, here's, a, here's a question that, um, that seems custom made for you here. It's from Sudhir. Machine learning and AI may seem overwhelming today, but what is more worrying is the scenario where robotic humanoids displace humans. How are we looking at that emerging scenario? Um, First, Kevin, have, have you been replaced by a robotic looking humanoid? I, I, you know, it's very hard to tell these days on Zoom. You might, you know, for all I know, uh, be a highly sophisticated uh, mechanical system at this point. Uh, yeah, you, you will never know because, uh, you know, this is, this is maybe the most convincing AI ever created. I mean, I, I'm sort of like, like, I sort of don't know what people say, mean when they say like half human half machine like i you know i stare at a screen all day i look at the news that the you know screen tells me to look at then i like look at my other screen and i look at what that machine tells me to and i like you know use the little gmail autocomplete thing to like write the thing that the machine tells me to so like am i a humanoid like maybe i mean i think like this sci-fi trope of like, you know, the bionic man where you have like one real arm and one, you know, metal arm has sort of let a, a genre of, of thinking sort of uh, develop that like the only way that we are endangered as humans from machines is if they literally become like part of our body. And I think there's this kind of like missing piece where it's like you, you you can become humanoid mentally. <laughs> like if you, if you are sort of uh, giving over control of your thoughts and behaviors and actions and values and priorities and beliefs and preferences to machines, like in some sense, you have made yourself a humanoid. Um, and there are good pieces of that and there, there are bad pieces of that. But yeah, I think the, the, the sort of, I'm not very scared of like an army of, you know, robo cops. Um, like, I think we're still a ways away from that. Um, but I do think that one thing that we've learned is that, you know, machines can have really big impacts on our interior life and our mental capacity. And, and I think that's something we need to take much more seriously. Yeah. One, one of the things that I, I, I really do think you do very well in the book is you urge us to take these topics seriously while urging us not to get too obsessed with 
you know, the robot army invading, right? And, and I think that sort of realization that, I, I think I quoted this line before, don't, don't worry about Skynet, worry about the spreadsheet. Um, you know, a lot of the book sort of looks at the ways in which jobs get automated, not by an army of robots, but by technologies that just suddenly change what the jobs are. Sometimes those jobs get replaced, sometimes they don't. It's not always clear what's going to happen uh, when job changes get made. Um, but I, I think where you know, where I thought the book was strongest actually is, is sort of you looking for ways to sort of reassert your own humanity and sort of try to um, keep yourself unique. Uh, I, I, can I just get you to talk a little bit about, you know, which of those are you actually doing, right? You have this appendix of, uh, of, of sort of your hacks that you're doing um, to keep you from being too predictable, to keep you from being too automatable. Um, are, are you, are you living up to those? Which, which ones have, have proven most helpful for you? Um, I am not living up to all of them. Um, but I am attempting to live up to most of them. Um, and I think that the, the one thing that I do try to do every day, I, I have what I call human hour, which is like, there's an hour and, and actually we're coming up on it now. It's like, you know, five to 6 PM <laughs> Pacific, when I try to just do something that reminds me that I'm a human being. So I'll go out in my garden and pull weeds or I'll take my, my dog for a walk, like something that is like not in front of a screen, um, but that is more than just not in front of a screen. It's like, it's like a, an earthy, like, you know, visceral experience that just reminds me like I have a body, I exist in a physical space. I am not just my digital avatar. And, and that's been really important for me. And I try to keep pretty consistent on that. Um, other things that I've been doing, um, I, uh, there's a whole chapter in, in the book about my war with my, my phone and uh, trying to sort of exert control over my phone uh, use and, and, and misuse. And so I'm, I'm doing okay on that front, although I definitely need another detox when, when the pandemic's over. Yeah, I think all these rules have to bend a little bit for the pandemic. I'm going to answer just a couple uh, of things that have come up in the questions because they're, they're sort of um, sure. in my wheelhouse on this. There's a question from Edwin referencing uh, a study in which a third of Americans wanted to turn the country over to the military. Another uh, group wanted a strong leader and, and fewer than 50% of those questions believed in representative democracy. Is this just cyclical or a permanent change? So this is actually a really cool study. I'm, I'm sort of curious whether you've bumped into this. Um, this is a study um, done by uh, FOA and Munk. Um, and it came out about three years ago. It's not actually a study that they ran themselves. They used something called the World Values Survey. And so they asked people all around the world the question, do you believe that it's essential to live in a democracy? And it turns out if you ask Americans who were born in the 1930s or 1940s, they're like, yes, absolutely. I must live in a democracy. It's like 80%. You ask people who were born in 1980, the answer is like 30%. So there's this falling curve, depending on what year people were born, of whether or not they think it's essential to live in a democracy. What's interesting is because it's on the World Values Survey, they're asking people in a bunch of different questions. And you see the same thing in the UK, in Scandinavia, in New Zealand. There seems to be what people are calling the deconsolidation of democracy. There was this sort of assumption that democracy was going to be the dominant political system. It was the system that won out. And now what we're seeing is people starting to say, well, I don't know. What's interesting is some of the people who are really good methodologists, like the people who run the World Values Survey, um, wrote a comment on this and sort of said, well, I don't know. You know, clearly in the US, we're losing our belief in democracy, but that's because US democracy is uniquely screwed up. It may be less true in Europe. So, you know, on that sort of specific question from Edwin, it doesn't appear to be cyclical. It actually appears to be very deep fear and mistrust of sort of what's going on with this system. And that sort of leads to, to Laura's question, which is what, what can you do at this point in the game? If people mistrust the government and media this deeply, uh, are we too far gone? That feels like a good question for, for both of us. My answer, and, and maybe it's a bit of an inept answer, 
is that people need to do what helps them feel effective, right? Um, if you feel like you can't have any influence on democracy, like your vote doesn't count, you can't get listened by anyone, obviously you're gonna feel helpless and alienated and you're gonna disconnect. Um, if you can find something where you feel capable of making a change, and maybe that's something that's local or maybe it's something that's very specific, then I think you can feel like you have some power. My work right now is on social media. Uh, which is an institution that I think is badly broken and is failing, but I also think is fixable, although probably not by tinkering with Facebook or Twitter, but by really building something radically different. And so I'm trying to follow my own advice by sort of looking for that place where I end up sort of feeling effective. Kevin, what's your your take on this? I mean, your your book in many ways is about sort of the individual finding his or her way sort of through this. When we think about the bigger systems, when we think about trust in the New York Times or trust in government, sort of all these issues that you find yourself researching, are, are we too far gone or is there a way to, um, to really have an effect on, on some of these questions of trust? I, I think there's still lots of things to be hopeful about. I mean, I think that, um, I've been really actually sort of pleasantly surprised by responses to the pandemic. Um, you know, in my neighborhood, you know, last year as the, as the lockdowns were starting there, you know, there sprung up this mutual aid network um, where people were shopping for groceries for each yeah. other and helping each other. And I think like rebuilding a sense of, of, of community, um, of small community, not sort of like community at the scale that, big tech companies talk about that. But I, I think that's been really important for a lot of people this year. And, and I, that gives me some hope. And I also think that can help with the trust gap. I mean, one thing that I've been pleasantly surprised by is I thought there were going to be many more people refusing the vaccine for COVID than there are. Um, and there, you know, there's been a lot, um, you know, depending on which survey you believe it's, you know, 20 or 30% of people say they're just like not interested in being vaccinated. But I thought that was going to be more like 50 or 60% because I just felt like people aren't going to trust it. There's already this Bill Gates 5G stuff starting. Um, and so there's just no way. But I think people have, they might not trust the CDC or the WHO, but they trust their, their, you know, their neighbor um, or they trust their, you know, their, their employer, um, or they trust their, you know, the, the people in their social media feeds that they see posting selfies from the vaccination sites. And so I think in, in some sense, like that has been a lesson that there are actually ways to kind of rebuild trust at the community level, even if it doesn't mean, you know, QAnon members subscribing to the New York Times, I think that would still be an improvement. I, I think actually, if, if you haven't, written about it in a column, and I apologize if, if, if you haven't, I missed it, but I think the vaccine selfie and vaccine confidence is actually something that you should write about. I, I think the next time you and I sit down to have this conversation, we should actually start with scale. Uh, I think one of the things that's so hard is that we live in a really big country. Uh, we interact with really big companies. Um, these are all at scales that are very, very hard for us to get our heads around. Um, we are still creatures that deal well with the scale of a couple hundred people. And if those couple hundred people, a bunch of them are going and getting vaccine shots, whatever we feel politically, we are much more likely um, to go ahead and get those vaccine shots. And so even if we're losing faith in the institutions, even if we're losing faith in the algorithms, um, faith in each other feels like something that we might be able to fall back on. Uh, but look, this this has been marvelous. I'm uh, going to wrap this up just because I don't want to uh, rely uh, too much on the generosity of our hosts. Uh, I want to thank uh, Marsha Eli for inviting both of us. Uh, I want to thank the Center for Brooklyn History of the Brooklyn Public Library. I want to thank everybody uh, who's been involved uh, with making this talk possible technically, uh, and particularly for the really thoughtful um, questions that have come up on this. Um, Kevin and I are both on Twitter. We're pretty easy to find there. If we didn't get a chance to answer your questions there, feel free to hit us up there. Um, he is Kevin Ruths, uh, argue, uh, the, the author of uh, Future Proof, Nine Rules uh, for Humans in the Age of Automation. 
And I don't have a, a, a print copy of your book. I have a PDF. So I'll just have to point at yours in your backdrop. Ethan is the, the author of Mistrust, which you should go check out. So Ethan, thank you so much. This is, it's always a pleasure. I could talk to you forever. And, um, and I think you, you know, you have a lot of wisdom on a lot of things that I care deeply about. So I'm, I appreciate you as always. It's always good fun. We'll do it again soon. Take care. All right. Take care.